During the long war with the Irish Republican Army, the IRA tried to kill Maggie Thatcher with a bomb in Brighton. They exploded bombs in London, including in the Canary Wharf. Uh, they'd been targeting civilians. There was even an attempt to lob a mortar into Number 10 Downing Street. You don't find British or English mobs looking for Irish men, women and children and burning them alive. So I don't see that as any kind of uh, uh, logical causation. And there was a July 83, 30 years before July 83, that was in 1958, a massive uh, anti tamil riot and an emergency had to be declared by the Prime Minister of the day, Mr. S. W. R. D. Bananayaka. He in fact relinquished, he gave power to the Governor General who declared emergency. And there's a book written by one of Sri Lanka's most distinguished journalists, Tazi Vitachi, who studied at Ananda College. It was called Emergency 58. The first wave of Tamil immigrants left Sri Lanka after the violence of 58. They were mainly professionals. And that's how the international sympathy for Elam, that whole movement started because by the time 83 happened, there were already those who belonged to the professions who had migrated after 58 and were members of British society. So, I, I think this 13 soldiers thing is, is something of a, of a cop-out. There's something else that I, I, I want to say. The Tigers were terrorists and fascists from the beginning. They started by murdering their own people. There was a guy called Kannadi Patmanathan who was a member of the LTT who was murdered. They were murdering people from their own people from uh, the 70s, certainly 81. Uh, they killed a guy who belonged to the plot, Sundaram. But, for some reason, the first killings of Sinhalese civilians, as distinct from army and police, happened one and a half years after July 83, not before. That's the historical record. The first massacres of Sinhalese civilians were in the fishing villages of Nayaru and Kokilai. And if I remember, uh, that was somewhere in 84. Well, let's take a step back from the 1983 uh, July, Black July. It's 30 years on. And when I asked you that question, the first thing you said, Doctor, was, have we learned lessons from the 1983 Black July? I'm going to ask you that question. Have we learned lessons? Has our politics matured since then, 30 years on? Some of us have. I would even say most of us have, but not on the fringes. And when I hear what is being said, the kind of invective about uh, uh, Mr. Vigneshwaran, about the provincial councils, about uh, what kind of country this is, what kind of country it should be. When I, uh, when I came back to Sri Lanka and I read and I saw and heard what was being said about the Muslims on public platforms. I mean, it sounded exactly what was said about the Tamils before July. And that's one reason that I did something I haven't done for a long time. I joined a demonstration uh, in Colombo because I thought, you know, never again. We, we can't allow the same thing to happen again. It was the Tamils then, it's going to be the Muslims now. There are dark forces in our society in the South uh, who have not only not learned the lessons, they are from of the same species. Some of them are the same guys. Some of them are the ideological descendants of those same people. We've had this anti-minority violence from 58. In 57, there was the Bananaka Chabanagam Pact. There was agitation against it, hate speech. And then it exploded in race riots or conflagration in 58. This is like an old record. This idea about the exclusive nature uh, of Sri Lanka, it belongs only to one community and the others have to stay down. If you manifest uh, your difference, your cultural difference in some way, then uh, or you assert your rights, then uh, if they can't argue with you, 
then they burn you down or cut you up or shut you down or use force. Now that is still there, not, I would say, certainly not in the leadership, but then it was not, I don't think Jaya Jawadhan ever felt that way, I don't think S.W.R.E. Baranaga felt that way, no? certainly I don't think Mahindra Rajapaksa believes that. Not at all. And that's the reason why the government is going ahead with the Northern Provincial Council elections, which we are going to hear the date announced in the near future. The elections are set for September. So the government can say, okay, we've gone through a bloody war. We've, we've tried to develop the country. We have gone 30 years back in development because of the war. And now we are trying to bring in democracy to the people most affected by the war, which was the people in the north. And now, for the first time in the history of Sri Lanka, elections are going to be held in the northern province. Yes. I mean, it is important that the government is doing something. And as John F. Kennedy used to say, uh, never mind what he says, watch his hands. I mean, watch what he does. So the government, certainly the president, is trying, however belatedly and for whatever reasons, to do the right thing. The point is, they're not saying it the way you're saying it. What you need is leadership. What you need is a vision, uh, such as that which Mandela practiced, uh, or Dharma Soka, if you want to you know, go back into the history of Buddhism, to tell the people what it's about and why we are doing it, and, and to offer a positive vision of the future. But when the moderates at the top are silent, and only the extremists keep on plugging away. That is when you have things like July 83. Because in July 83, certainly uh, the mainstream was not for it, was not part of it. But they were, they were blindsided and they were silent. And that's a moral failure. But the Northern Provincial Council elections could be used as a lesson that we have learned from all of this. It could be and it has to be. In fact, it is... Uh, it is the logical consequence of our military victory over the Tigers. It also shows that we have learned after 30 years, that we have, we have learned our lessons and that we are ready to get back on course because July 3 uh, was, uh, we were train wreck after that. And this is our chance to get back on track. And if I am not mistaken, in our previous show you said it's a little too late, the Northern Provincial Council elections, it should have been happening in 2009 yeah. after we won the war. Yeah. But nevertheless it is happening and yeah. we see a lot of the parties gearing up, political parties coming in. Uh, we've seen the Tamil National Alliance which is uh, one of the main strong parties for the Northern Provincial Council, announcing their chief ministerial candidate in a retired Supreme Court judge, yeah. C.V. Vigneshwaran. What are your thoughts about his candidacy? Well, I think it was a brilliant move by Mr. Sambandan. I mean, we know from the papers that it wasn't uh, the initial unanimous choice. Uh, it looked like uh, the Jaffan branch of the Federal Party, the ITAK, wanted Mr. Mave Senadiraja to come forward. Mave Senadiraja has um, a lot of political experience in that area. But I think that uh, Mr. Sambandan and Mr. Sumandaran quite rightly urged the candidacy of uh, Justice Vigneshwaran because he is a person who has multiple attributes, characteristics which make him the best for the job. He is somebody that uh, the Tamil community can be proud of. He is also somebody that the rest of Sri Lanka can be proud of. Uh, in fact, I, I really don't understand why some um, cabinet ministers, not belonging to the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, of course, have been so viciously hostile about him because here's a man who never had anything to do with the Tigers. I mean, not even out of fear, did he even once say anything supporting the Tigers. He was, during the war, he was in our justice system. He was in the state. He was uh, hearing cases which included uh, PTA cases, Prevention of Terrorism Act. Uh, he was serving in singular majority areas, in Tamil majority areas. He moved up uh, through the court system. And uh, not once have I heard any association of lawyers or judges accusing him of being ethnically biased. Um, successive governments endorsed his rise through the judiciary. 
until he reached the Supreme Court and then he retired. Now, this is a distinguished Sri Lankan of Tamil ethnic origin. Uh, he's a student of Royal College, he edited the Royal College magazine, he got an LLB from the University of Ceylon, he was uh, the president of the Law College Students Association, um, he speaks all three languages, English, Tamil and Sinhala, um, and his, his children are married to Sinhalese. Now, uh, what's there not to like? I mean, uh, I think we should be happy that after a long time, uh, we are going back to that period where educated people, professionals, people of distinction are actually agreeing, however reluctantly, to enter public life and politics.